What's up, you guys? It is day three of Romance Genre Con, which is already better than all the other genre cons because all the other genre cons have been squished down into two days. Woo! We love MCPL. <laughs> I am Hannah Taylor. That was Morgan Perry, if you didn't recognize her. And we are with Mid-Continent Public Library, but you guys aren't here to watch us be psychos online. You guys are here for the toolkit for revealing character with one of my new favorite people in the entire world. And most people are being like really facetious when they say that, but I'm not. I'm being 100% sincere when I say that Elizabeth Essex is one of the coolest, most interesting, delightful humans that I've ever met. And you're going to feel the exact same way. So if we could bring Elizabeth on real quick, I just want to take a moment to congratulate her on a very huge accomplishment, Elizabeth. Guys, she is a USA Today <laughs> best-selling author for this book. Whoop, point the right way. That book I right can't. there. <laughs> so you've always been you've always been a bestseller in our hearts, but now you have the sticker to prove it. And you That's know, it. we're just gonna go around shouting it to everybody. Uh, but we also want to surprise you with a little throwback photo so if we could bring that up really oh, quick no. <laughs> oh <laughs> yes you gotta love it so elizabeth real quick i i want to get the the backstory on this photo if you could just, just real quick let us know what the heck is going on in this picture well clearly this is some very spicy on dit being given out at a ball at the historical romance retreat and i think that that was in 2018 because we had a grand ball and we are all in our uh 18th century gowns and uh we were in the corner because i'm a dowager clearly and i have all the best gossip which these two young ladies <laughs> came to find it's one of my favorite oh my pictures, gosh. not least because just the fabulous costumes everybody's wearing, but these two delightful human beings are just some of my favorite people to chat books with. Just adore them. I, I think I'm going to make this like the background on my desktop. So you know, if everybody's <laughs> okay with that, we're going to get the sign off and we're just going to change that because it's one of my favorite pictures now ever. Uh, but, you know, like I said earlier, you guys aren't here to watch me fangirl with the coolest person ever. Uh, you guys are here to learn about how to reveal character in your writing. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our personal hero, former nautical archaeologist and USA Today bestselling author, <laughs> Elizabeth Essex. Oh, well, thank you for that very kind introduction and smooches of book love. I can see the chat over here. I'm seeing lots of people I love. Mwah. Thank you. Hello. I'm so happy to see you. Big hugs to everybody. I know we've all been stuck in our crazy own spaces for a while, and we may be here yet for a little while. So I'm thrilled that I get to come to all of you tonight on Romance Genre Con. So let's get started. We've got a lot to cover, but don't worry. It's all in the handout. If you can't find it, put it in the chat that you can't find it. And one of the absolutely fabulous people from Genre Con, Hannah or Megan or Morgan, will help and make sure that you find the link to that. So almost every example is in the handout. So don't worry that you have to write any of this down. Just sit back and let all the examples kind of wash over you. I've got tons and tons of them because I never know what it's going to be that's going to spark your imagination. What voice is going to make you go, oh, that. So got lots of different people's work we're going to read together and find out how we can take the characters that you already have in your head and put them on the page for the, to share with the reader. All right, let's get going. Oh, we got started. <laughs> I believe every word in your manuscript can be made to serve your characters. Everything that's going on, no matter what, should be about the characters. I'm going to prove it to you because we're going to start by talking about this setting. But first, I'm going to go over a little vocabulary with you. Oh, we're going to find six different ways to do this. <laughs> And we're not going to go all over all of them together tonight, 
but all of it is in the handout. So we're going to go in depth through about four of the ways that I think you should be putting your characters on the page. Now we're going to go over our vocabulary and our color key. Those of you who may have taken a Margie Lawson course or anything on her Margie Lawson universe of courses will be familiar with these because these are some of her vocabulary that I've adopted because I teach for her as well. So power words. These are the words in your manuscript that have psychological power or strong associations and they drive up tension in the manuscript. Now it's gonna vary from genre to subgenre, from voice to voice. Uh, in my historical romance, for example, um, you know, some words that won't be the same as in um, paranormal romance. I, I'm blanking on what I'm talking about in this particular instance, but some sort of Regency words. Uh, gossip would be a power word in my universe, and it might not be in yours. So it's very subjective, but just keep rolling with it and look for the words in your genre that are going to drive up the tension and have psychological undertones. And they're gonna be in red. So the next are the scene themed words. These are the words that are gonna tell you what's in the room where it happens what's in front of your character, what they can see, what's happening in the world around them. Generally things you can touch and see and smell and feel. Think of it as the things in the room where it happens. Okay. And oh, those are going to be green because the grass is green. Now character themed words, that's what we're concentrating on tonight. These are going to give us insight into the backstory and the minds and thoughts of your particular characters. These are the words that only they would think of with their particular backstory. They reveal your character as they describe other people, other places, other things. But that juxtaposition is what we're gonna look for the whole time. We're gonna reveal as we describe. Okay. And parsing. Parsing is this coloring the sentences and picking out what things are. Generally, it's the easiest thing to find power words first, then go back and find the things the character can see, the scene themed words. And then we're gonna look for and try to find the character themed words that reveal our character. And if we can't find them, especially in our first drafts, that's our opportunity to put them in. All right, are we ready to roll? Let's get started with setting because even your setting can be about your character. Let's go to our first slide. Oh, it's a dark and stormy night. It's a make, way to make you remember what we're gonna talk about. The world of your novel. This is from The Danger of Desire and you can see on the slides, I've got the power scene and character themed words colorized and a little key at the bottom. So in case you get a little lost, but let's start with this quote. This is the beginning of the danger of desire. It was as cold and raw as a St. Giles curse. Nothing kept out the aching damp. Ostensibly, this is about this place, St. Giles in the middle of London, and we know it is a bad place because it comes with a curse. But who's cold here? Who's feeling raw? Who's feeling cursed? Our heroine, and. I'm trying not always to use heroine, so I'm gonna switch back to protagonist. Our protagonist, our point of view protagonist in this case is a street thief who is out in the middle of the night looking for one more flat pinch. She's got one more wallet she's gotta get. So she's the one who's cold. She's the one who's raw. She's the one who's cursed. Does that make sense? Okay, let's look at the next one. Hugh McAlden's leg had begun to ache. The cold, raw walk up from Chelsea had taken more out of him than he had anticipated. Normally, the leg only pained him when it rained, but this was England. The only place wetter was the bilge of its ship. So we know something about this man right from the get-go. We've filled in his backstory without saying, Captain Hugh McAlden used to be a Royal Navy captain. He's been injured. How boring would that be? But you found that out just by this description 
of the cold, raw walk up from Chelsea. Again, he's cold and he's raw. Oh, but what else are we talking about here? Subtext for the book. We're setting up the tone. The tone and the characters should be interwoven here. Okay, so what you want to ask yourself in this paragraph is, what's the only place wetter for your character? What's the only place drier for your character? What's the only place scarier for your character? Make it about your character. Okay, let's go to the next. This is a very different kind of voice, but I love this so much. I want you to look for three things that she's telling us about her protagonist. The day the town buried Catherine Wyatt, the weather had been glorious up until the moment the bearers set the coffin in the ground. A thunderstorm came up out of nowhere to pelt the mourners with wind. Whoops, see, I did it wrong. The mourners with rain, wind, thunder, lightning, and hail the size of crab apples. As they all ran for cover to await the storm's fury, one of her aunt's friends swore Catherine was up in heaven, arguing with the Lord. Three things right off the bat that are about the character. The town buried Catherine Wyatt. So our heroine, Hester, is part of a tight-knit community. Hail the size of crab apples. Where does she live? In the country and an orchard. And Catherine was up in heaven arguing with the Lord. She's a believer. Three very important things that are going to be important as we go on in the story revealed to us in a paragraph that is ostensibly about a thunderstorm. Look what she's doing here. Brilliant. Our Beverly Jenkins, Indigo. Yeah, pretty fabulous, isn't it? Okay, let's go to the next one. This is from a very different um, Catch of the Day, Kristen Higgins. It is a contemporary, uh, it's more humor. So, because I know there's lots of you who have got, I've seen uh, that you have some people who are doing YA, we have some PNR, we have some erotica, and we have some contemporary suite. I saw all sorts of different answers there. And at Cozy, I saw you, Sharon. Um, yay. So, we're going to look at a lot of different genres. Okay. Kristen Higgins, Catch of the Day. The wind is a little stronger here, and it's still quite cold, though it's almost April. The rock is like ice under my bottom, but it feels good, clean, and solid. I'm sorry, but the rock underneath my bottom generally never feels clean and good. I mean, that's just me. I would have been like, oh, I'm freaking freezing. Get me out of here. But this is a story about what this character, this protagonist, wants. She's describing the weather at this in this town in Maine in April. We know exactly where we are. It's still icy, but she's talking about what this protagonist wants. She's talking about the what the book is going to be about, this young woman's search for something good, clean, and solid. It's about the weather, it reveals the character. You with me, everybody? If you're not, write me in, write me a little right into the comments and we'll come up here and we'll answer it as we go along. So please don't hesitate to stop me. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, I'm gonna have to go really on to this one. This is The Care and Feeding of Waspish Widows by Olivia Waite. The library was the primary battlefield in the war between order as represented by the housekeeper and her strictly tamed staff, and chaos, as embodied solely but sensationally by Joanna Molesley. Stacks of books the poet had pulled out for her use in writing would be crudely tidied away before she was finished with them. As a counterattack, she would rearrange the shelves in unusually frustrating ways and see how long it took Mrs. Bedford to notice the Shakespeare volumes were out of order because Joanna had set them alphabetically by first line or reshelved the history section in order of ascending length of title. So this is a little description of a library. The protagonist is here because a will is about to be read. 
but it is a story about the battle between order and chaos and the people who set Joanna, who sets that chaos into play in the protagonist's life. Subtext and its tone of the rest of the story. It describes a library and what's going on there, but it reveals what's happening to the protagonist for the rest of the book. You with me? Okay. Very different tone. Here we have our first grave from the right, Dorinda Jones, adore her writing. Night was so dark, probably because of the time, but the moonlight helped, but traversing the uneven ground still proved challenging. So I've got probably because of the time in purple here because humor is its own sort of manifestation of character. And in this series, in the Grave series, uh, the protagonist, Charlie, is the physical personal embodiment of the Grim Reaper. But she's got this wise, cracking sense of humor that is part of her character. So we see humor used here to reveal her throughout the story. And I'm gonna go back to a lot of these same books throughout the whole of the talk so that you can see that these aren't one-offs, that these authors come back and redo this idea of revealing their characters, no matter what they're talking about, all the way through the book. There's Dorinda. Okay, let's go next. Dawn lightened the sky over the silent, fallow fields. The harvest had long since been taken in, and the fields remained empty. Bonaparte's insatiable hunger for soldiers for his grand army had robbed Finisterre of its working farmers. This is from my Almost a Scandal, and it's a book about a young woman who takes her brother's place on a Royal Navy ship and the lieutenant that um, she falls very hard for, but not before he's fallen farther. Anyway. This is from uh, the protagonist, Lieutenant Collier's uh, point of view, and he is on a special assignment in the country, and he looks out over the fields, and as he describes the fields, he reveals himself to be somebody who thinks about things in terms of strategy. Why are the fields fallow? Nobody but a soldier or a sailor or somebody who is engaged in this particular war against Napoleon would look at fallow fields and think of them in terms of how did they get in this place? It's because of the war. So we're describing fallow fields, but we're revealing not only the war, but we're revealing his part of the war. We've described the field, we've revealed the protagonist. And it's, it's not that complicated. It's just pretty, oh, this is how he sees the field. What you have to ask yourself when you're writing is, how does my protagonist see whatever it is that they're looking at? How, does, how do they see it differently from everybody else? How do we filter it through their backstory and their experience of their world? Okay. Next. Again, from Almost a Scandal, it was a day for the ages, the kind of high, bright, windy day and fast sail every sailor lived for. They are chasing another ship. They are about to go in battle, but they love it. Only somebody who is a sailor is going to think of this windy, windy day like this. Only a sailor. What would uh, only a pilot think of a day for the ages? It would be the kind of high ceiling and clear air. I don't know, something like that. I'm not a pilot, so I don't know what they would look for, but you need to filter everything they're looking at through their experience. Okay, next. This is one of my favorites, and we're gonna play with this a little. They drove through the dappled light of a tunnel of overhead branches, the plane trees lined like soldiers for miles. This is Cherry Adair's Afterglow. You get a very, very strong visual picture of this arch of branches overhead, but the plane trees are lined like soldiers for a mile. 
this is a stuntman who's ex-military. Only somebody who is military would see a line of trees and think lined like soldiers for miles. But what if we played with it? Let's go to the next one. What if the character's an aid worker? They drove through the dappled light of a tunnel of overhead branches, the gnarled trees lined like refugees for miles. You see a different kind of set of trees in your mind's eye, but it also reveals the backstory of the main character. Describe and reveal. Are you with me? I'm not getting any questions. Drop them in if you need them. Let's look at the next one. Okay, what if the character is a governess or a teacher? They drove through the dappled light of a tunnel of overhead branches, the tightly planted trees lined like obedient children for miles. I see them all squashed up next to each other like they're at recess or about in or out of recess because there's no such thing as obedient children. But that reveals a governess. It reveals a teacher. It's the same thing that Cherry was describing with her march of plain trees. It's the same thing that our aid worker is describing, but this last bit reveals each to be a different character who's looking at those trees. Okay? So there's the lesson is, everything around your character can be made to reveal them. Now, we're going to move on to the next part that I think is really, really super important. And since this is romance, Sean Rakan, I'm going to key in on romance in particular. Um, in romance, the way the two protagonists, or three if you write um, threesomes or whatever, the way your protagonists see something different, something special, something um, Michael Haig calls this sort of the, the inner person. Um, when you the characters see that in the other person, it's a really important point of a romance novel. And when your character sees that thing, it's very revealing about them. So we're gonna look at this point in a romance novel in a, lots of different examples to show us um, how important it is. Here's looking at you. All right. The pale muslin dress tied with a sash of bright green satin to match her eyes accentuated the liquid grace of her body. On anyone else, the gown would have looked demure. On Lizzie, it looked like a challenge. So here is an instance of where in my Regency and Georgian romance, demure is a power word. And demure would probably not be a power word in a, a contemporary setting. But for me, it is here. But he's looking at her. He's given us a very good visual description, but he's revealed himself that it's not demure. It looks like a challenge. Do you think our hero is going to accept that challenge? Yes. Yes, he is. He's going to spend the whole rest of the book just on that challenge. That's what a romance is. Okay, let's go to the next. On any other man, now I've set this up particularly because it's the same kind of language almost as the last because they're both from me. So I get to use my own language again. <laughs> on any other man, such a look might have appeared plain and underdone. On Strathcairn, the blaze of unadorned red velvet seemed to highlight the force of his personality, and there was nothing she liked as so much as personality, unless it was a challenge. The Earl appeared to be both. Now, this particular mad about the Marquis is uh, our protagonist, we Quince Winthrop, is what we would now call a kleptomaniac. She is not a good girl. She's a lot of fun, but she's not good. And she has just um, pickpocketed this particular fellow because this blaze of unadorned red velvet was just too much not to do. She has to go pickpocket him. 
and then she's found out who he is. So we have the same setup as before. Uh, this should look one way, but to our protagonist, it looks differently. Only this girl who is a pickpocket and a kleptomaniac uh, who can't resist temptation would look at somebody's red velvet suit this way. We're describing him, but we're revealing her. Let's go to the next. The Scandal Before Christmas. This is another one of mine. The knot in his gut strangled itself into disappointment. Ian was entirely underwhelmed. The girl was as plain and unappealing as a pike staff. A pike staff he had no alternative but to marry. So here we have a protagonist who is looking at the person who will be the love interest and he just doesn't see that thing. And I felt it was a really important moment to sort of go after because he's desperately wrong and we're going to find out just how wrong and she's going to make him sure he sees that throughout the rest of the book. But we're describing her through his eyes. She's really not unappealing. She's really not as plain as a pike staff. And pike staff here, I've repeated twice. We are going to have a whole section later in your handout on rhetorical devices. And as we go through, sometimes you'll see some little under... Sometimes as we go through, you'll see some underlines uh, within the text, and that's usually to show an alliteration or other... Uh, rhetorical device. So think about those kinds of things while you're writing. Plain as a pike staff, a pike staff, he had no alternative. It's a lovely little juxtaposition here and just brings the moment up. Pike staff has this marvelous little sort of uh, military connotation to us because he is a uh, naval man. So we get a little bit of a weapon. She is a little bit of a weapon and that will be revealed as we go on. Okay, so he's describing her wrongly, but he's revealing himself to be very wrong. Okay, let's move on. From the danger of desire, he wanted to haul her across his desk like a witless midshipman, but she wasn't a witless midshipman. She was as sharp and lethal as a hand spike. This is a little instance of I wanted to say she's dangerous. I wanted us to recognize that he recognizes she's dangerous. So I sort of looked around the room where it happens for him. He is a Royal Navy captain. The action in this particular book takes place on land in London, but his whole backstory, his whole experience of the world is filtered through his Navy experience because that's where he's been almost every day of his life from the age of 14 until he has recently been put ashore with his wounded leg. So I looked around the room where it happened and I thought, what is the smallest, neatest, most innocuous, lethal thing in his world? And I came up with this little thing, a hand spike that separates ropes. Um, it can look like um, an ivory tusk sometimes. They used tusks for this, but it's sharp and small and fits in his hand. That's describing her. Those things are all about her. So in this case, he is describing her, but he's revealing both his backstory and what she is going to be to him. And this lovely little word, hand spike, you get spike. So it's like, pay attention, pay attention. She's dangerous. Also a little, um, little note of uh, craft. You will often notice as you go back through your handout that the big word, the power word, the character revealing word comes at the end of the sentence or at the end of a paragraph like this hand spike. That's a technique known as backloading. And we can make sure that we get our money out of our backloading by making it a power word and hopefully a character themed word. So we double down and get more bang for our buck when we put the word that's the most important, that's gonna stick. It's like it's sticky tackum to stick in the reader's brain right there at the end of the sentence. Backloading. I'm sure a ton of you know that. I'm just gonna 
make sure you use it more often because it's a great technique. And we see it because we're like Oz behind the curtain or in the kitchen seeing how the sausage gets made. But readers will just read this and think, yeah, yeah, I get it. Okay, let's go on. Back from Cherry Adair's Afterglow. No matter what had happened between them, no matter how many questions remain unasked and unanswered, the sight of her stole his breath harder than a fall from a 10-story building. Okay, look at all these rhetorical devices going on here. Cherry is telling us in so many ways, pay attention here. This is a big reveal how this protagonist feels about the love interest. And this is our military ex-cop or ex-military who is a stuntman. It works because only a stuntman has taken a fall from a 10-story building. Whoosh. No matter, no matter, unasked, unanswered, sight, stole, story. Look at the cadence whooshing us along here. It's brilliant. It's fabulous. Do that. Let's go to the next. Back to catch of the day with Kristen Higgins. Life has left its mark on Malone's face with a heavy hand, but it's an interesting face, scruffy and rugged and gloomy. His cheekbones are sharp and angular, carved by the wind almost. And it's this phrase that makes me realize I shouldn't have ordered that second glass of wine. Again, like Dorinda Jones, humor is a huge part of this particular character and Higgins' voice as a writer. Um, other people who have a voice that it's full of humor like that that come to mind are Tracy Brogan. Brilliant, very funny voice. But here, this is a kind of self-deprecating humor. It's not the same kind of wise cracking, I know everything, ha ha, that you get from, say, Charlie in Dorinda Jones's Grave series. This is a very self-deprecating kind of humor, but it's humor nonetheless that, that reveals her character. Like she can't hold her wine. She's out of her depth with this man. Oh, and I love that. Yes, we can talk about that. We're going to get some examples. That would be stupendous to have some examples as we go on. Okay, and again, Mark Malone, heavy hand. But this is a lovely little piece of work, scruffy and rugged and gloomy. Those three things don't go together. That's a rhetorical device. So it's marvelous that this particular protagonist, the one who's searching for something safe and clean and solid, also likes gloomy. That's going to be a problem, isn't it? Yeah, it's, but it's going to be fun to solve that problem. Yes, I think these definitely, um, thank you, pop that one up. I think they can be used across genres. I'm going to have some examples from Anagira's Grim Space, which is uh, science fiction fantasy. I've got some middle grade examples too. I really think it's going to depend on your voice, the audience you're writing for, but I think some degree of this can be used across all genres. I think it just works particularly well in romance. And I'm giving you mostly romance here because we're in romance genre con. But yes, thank you for that question. Okay, let's go to the next. This is from A Sense of Sin. He looked at her with such infinite disdain as if he were a lion and she were too skinny a Christian to bother eating. Oh, just that lion, you can sort of, oh, not even going to bother that big mane of hair. She's describing him physically, this big, tawny fellow. She is telling us that he makes her feel like she is prey. And she is, he's coming after her. But she, our protagonist, is a self-taught scientist, as many women were in this particular period, uh, when there was no formal education to pursue the sciences, they had to pursue them on their own. But this image of the lion kind of runs throughout the whole of the book. We'll see it a little bit later in another example. But this is when he's looking at her and she sees how he looks at her. She's describing him, but she's revealing herself. And she's revealing how she thinks he looks at her. It's a lot to reveal, but it's very revealing. All right, let's move along. 
Almost a scandal, back to our Royal Navy ship. Six years ago, he had been long and lean, but by God, clad in the endless fall of his gray sea cloak, he was a leviathan now. I could have said a giant. I could have said, I don't know, something, uh, trolls in the dungeon. Uh, I could have said maybe a troll because that would have worked. But I wanted something that was from the sea because this is a man whose entire life, his entire being is part of the sea. He will not leave the ship because for reasons, but he hasn't left his ship in years at this point in the story. He is a creature fully of the sea and she hasn't quite real realized that yet in this point in the story, but we're revealing him to her as a Leviathan. Think of the one word that will describe the big thing, the big, maybe a little out of control, uncontrollable thing in your protagonist's life, in their backstory. Think of what it would be. That's the word you pick. That's the character themed word. The word that only fits this character. The word only this character would think of. All right, let's move on. Lovely male male Regency or historical anyway, Cat Sebastian's The Lawrence Brown Affair. Love this book so much. He was, there was no way around it, as much as Lawrence might have wished, ridiculously beautiful, with fine features that looked carved out of ivory, black hair and eyes that were blacker still, cool and polished and fixed on Lawrence. Lawrence wanted to stare, to admire this man the way one might admire a sketch tacked to the wall of a prison cell. It's a fairly romantic description all the way through. Very beautiful man, very intriguing look, but it's kind of a romance. You expect this, you expect this beautiful feature. But the second paragraph is devastating in what it reveals. He wants to admire this man the way one might admire a sketch tacked to the wall of a prison cell. Breaks your heart because you realize that this man has been imprisoned and it is because he is gay in this period or he thinks he is a mad sort of, it's not exactly clear, but there's a tragedy in this man's backstory that he reveals while he's just simply looking at this other man. Breaks my heart every time. It's brilliant. I love it. It's the kind of heartbroken you want to get when you're reading a romance, isn't it? Okay. This Anna Gira's Grimm's Face I just talked to you about. Science fiction and fantasy. I don't get up as the door glides open. Then I wish I had. Because it's nobody I expected. Nobody I know. Rhetorical devices, just like the last one. Okay. He's tall, seems taller because I'm sitting down. And he has the rough-hewn, authoritative face, the look you see on men who are accustomed to getting their own way. Doesn't look like he's ever cracked a smile. Grave as, well, the grave. So there's a little bit of humor there, a little bit of wise crackiness. But she describes this man, tall, taller, rough-hewn, authoritative, this is a man who is going to have authority over her. The look you see on men who are accustomed to getting their own way. Is this protagonist going to let this man get his own way? I think not. There you go. She reveals herself while she's describing him. Let's go on. Senses. Oh, yes. Okay, so we want to end up that little section of us seeing the love interest, the co-protagonist, use those moments, especially when they are revealed to each other, to reveal more of them to your readers. Reveal as you describe, describe and reveal. Now we're going to move on. We've just mostly been looking at each other at this point, having our protagonists look at each other. We want to use all the senses, though. They're important. 
So we're going to make our novel a sensory experience for our readers. Let's move on. Using the five senses to reveal our characters. We're going to start with scent and smell. Audacious was a well-run ship, and as they descended into the hull, the dense, oily smells of tar and oakum enveloped her. To Sally, the pungent scent was headier than any perfume. It was a balm to the disquiet in her soul. So we get this pungent, oily, dense, tar, oakum, very descriptive words. But what reveals it is that she thinks it's a perfume. She thinks it's a balm to the disquiet in her soul. She wants to be on ships. She wants to be, her family has all come from a uh, seafaring background. She grew up on her father's ship and her younger brother was supposed to take his place and he runs off and refuses and for the sake of family honor and also because she really, 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 really wants to, she goes in his place. Only this girl who has grown up with that backstory would have this nasty, and it's a nasty smell, being a balm to the disquiet in her soul, a perfume. Only this character would s s experience the scent that way. Let's move on. Oh, this is the loveliest little book, The Goose Girl by Shannon Hale. It is a middle grade retelling of a fairy tale. Just absolutely delightful. Her nightmare still clung to her like the smell of smoke to cloth. I just get wood smoke all up in my nose in that. This is a lovely little, very direct, very middle grade. It's not complicated. Nightmare is like the smell of smoke. She's also giving us more about what's going to happen, what's going to happen in the plot, what's going to happen to the character who's going to be revealed as uh, someone who can talk to nature. That's not quite right, but she understands and hears the language of nature around her and most especially the language of the wind and what's carried on the wind and it's going to prove very important and it is how she is going to save herself and her kingdom in the long run in the story. But it's very direct, which is very appropriate for middle grade. It clung to her like the smell of smoke to cloth. Look at that clung, cloth, smell, smoke. What words can you play with to get some cadence going? What word can you put in there that's going to reveal a little bit more about your character? Do what she's done. Let's go with voice. The sharp vertical lines of the scowl between his dark brows could have scraped barnacles off a hull, but his voice was incongruously soft. This is his Roy majesty's Royal Navy, Kent, not a damned church fet. We're not gonna issue you a bloody invitation. She pushed her own voice lower toward the waterline. I, sir, I'm Richard Kent. I know, he rumbled. Now get in the bloody boat. So we have a lovely juxtaposition between two voices here, and it's all filtered through the sea, the water. Uh, we have a scowl being scraping barnacles off a hull. She's pushing her voice towards the water. Barnacles smooth, low towards the water line. Get in the bloody boat. She's going to get in the bloody boat. We're describing his voice, but she's revealing how she's reacting to it. We're revealing more of their backstory in how we describe the voice. Let's go on to the next. Again, Cat Sebastian, this is from The Soldier's Scoundrel. I'm not your gatekeeper, she said a moment later, her tone deceptively mild. But on her last word, Jack could hear the trace of that old accent that they had both worked so hard to shed. Sarah had to be driven to distraction if she was letting her accent slip. Just a little one snippet of dialogue, but he listens to the way she says it and he reveals this big thing about their background, the accent they had both worked so hard to shed. We don't even have to know that it was probably not a great 
accent, that it's an accent that they felt held them back, that now they're sort of disguising their natural voices to try to get ahead. And the story about a scoundrel, that's part of him. So he's describing her voice, but he's revealing both of their backstories. All right, let's go on. Again, back to Grimm's face. I love this with Anagira. It's been a week since I heard another human voice, not counting my AI. I swear programmers code them to be annoying, pedantic little forks. I promised I wouldn't swear. Um, an AI, artificial intelligence, she is in a holding cell on, let's just call it a space station or a spaceship. Uh, she's been a week since she's heard another human voice. It's not even another human, and she's describing how this disembodied voice makes her feel annoyed. It's a pedantic little. She's revealing her state of mind. She's revealing how she feels about being held in a holding cell. It's awful, but it's also, uh, she's got a little of that sort of uh, gallows humor. She's a little tough, right? She's not cowering in fear in her holding cell. She's getting pissed off at the AI. She's revealing the character while she's describing the voice from the intercom. It's fabulous. Okay, let's look at the next. Boy, God and all the bloody weeping angels in heaven. What boy, she squeaked. Lord help her, she did, squealed like a rusty eel cart. Old Nan would be ashamed of her giving herself away like that. But old Nan wasn't the boy's sister. So the danger of desire is our story about uh, the pickpocket living on the street. And now she's found that uh, her brother has been sort of swept up uh, into this problem, <laughs> into the plot. Her brother's been embroiled in the plot now. But we, while she's talking about her own voice, that she squeaked and squealed like a rusty eel cart, something from her life on the street in London. What would your character's voice squeak like? I don't know. If they're a professor, like the engineering students' unoiled chains on their bicycles. Always bothered me in graduate school. They'd come by. Stuck in my brain. Anyway, what is the thing in your protagonist's life that would describe the way their voice squeaked? She's giving us her whole backstory about her kid woman, Nan, who taught her how to be a pickpocket. And there's little snippets of her life with Nan, old Nan, revealed all the way through the story because she's the closest thing to a mother figure and a backstory that this girl has. She's describing her own voice. She's revealing her backstory. Okay, let's go to the next. Oh, I love this. This is from Harbor, Harbor for the Nightingale. I had it here a minute ago. It's not here. My very English stepmother ignores them all and marches straight for the receiving line. She holds her nose aloft and her mouth pinched up so tight that her porcelain white face looks almost skeletal. And out of tune clarinet, she squeaks towards us. So this in this particular, I'd say it's YA historical with uh, magical sort of realism thrown in. Uh, it's a School for Unusual Girls, Strange House, School for Unusual Girls series. This particular character, her, not quite superpower, but her gift, her strangeness, comes in the way she experiences sound. And this is going to come all the way through the book. But here... This is what the thing that squeaks in her world is, an out-of-tune clarinet. She gives us this brilliant little brittle, flashy, hard thing to think about to tell us that her stepmother is brittle, hard, and flashy without ever saying that because she reveals the way she sees and experiences the world auditorily through this out-of-tune clarinet. I think it's quite brilliant. I just adore Kathleen Baldwin's writing. Middle, no, I'd say YA, historical. Okay, describe and reveal. Physicality, always very important in a romance, super fun. 
Let's go on. Here we're going to go back to that lion. He had all but prowled into the book room with the same rangy, swinging stride as the great lion pacing its cage at the traveling zoological exhibit, all tawny, ferocious, ah, hunger, and pitiless, searching eyes. So again, now we find out exactly where that lion imagery comes from in our character's story. She has seen the traveling zoological exhibit, the little cage on wheels with this lion pacing relentlessly back and forth. That is how she sees this character. He is prowling. He is coming after her. He is dangerous to her. But she reveals all of this in the way she describes him as the great lion pacing its cage. She could have said he prowled into the book room like I don't know, an alley cat or the fat cat at home. The fat cat at home would be a very different image, very much more domesticated, right? But she thinks of him this way because he is dangerous to her. What's the thing in the room where your protagonist has been? What's the thing in the room where the scene happens? Pick something there. Find your character themed words there. Okay, let's go to the next. Back to Catch of the Day with Kristen Higgins. His arms are around me so tightly I can hardly breathe. It's like being pulled against a granite wall, safe and solid. Here are those two words again, safe and solid. Now listen, if I were being pulled against a granite wall, I don't know if I would feel that it was safe and solid, but that's me and that's not this character. That's how his arms around her so tightly, it's safe and solid to her. A another writer who's writing a thriller would change uh, this scenario. We could describe the same things. His arms are around me so tightly, I can hardly breathe. It's like being pushed into, oh, that's a very different feel, right? Very different tone, very different thing being revealed. This character wants this tightness, wants this closeness. That's what's safe and solid to her. And it comes through, these words come all the way through the book. And I know it might seem to you when you see these pulled out as a little bit too much, right? You're like going, okay, we get it. But when you're the reader, you don't see this sausage being made. You just get this taste. It works. Trust me, trust Kristen Higgins. Who else are you gonna trust if you're not gonna trust Kristen, right? Fabulous. All right, the Lawrence Brown affair again. John the footman entered holding the door open for an impossibly small child. He was eight years old, Georgie knew, but he was so thin and little, he could have been much younger. Perhaps young gentlemen at pricey schools didn't have a much better time of it than the apprentices and pickpockets Georgie had grown up with. Oh my goodness. So it's just the footman opens the door, a little child, a tiny child comes in. But Georgie with his own backstory of want and deprivation sees this child differently, sees the want and deprivation in his life. He's describing this child, he's revealing his own life. It's kind of brilliant, right? Okay, I'm checking the time. How are we doing? We're coming up on an hour. Good. We're right where we need to be. All right, let's move to the next. We're going to move on to taste because this is all of these sensory things are really important and I think they're especially important in a romance novel. So let me pull, make sure I am up to the page where I need to be in case I lose my pace. Let's go on to the first taste. She tasted of the rain, slick and earthy like water, and he was nothing but a salt bed, parched and dry. So, okay, we could take the first part of that. That's just a very romance novel thing. We've just had our first kiss, right? We've been waiting for this. We're always waiting for this in a romance novel. How many more pages? Get to it, get to it, get to it. She tastes of the rain, slick and earthy like water. They're outside, they're in the rain. 
they need to huddle together for warmth. Scottish rain, it's almost as good as there's only one bed. But he was nothing but a salt bed, parched and dry. Okay, we're up in the Scottish Highlands and we're in the rain. And why is he a salt bed, parched and dry? Because it's the opposite, opposite, opposite thing that I could possibly think of. Because this is an amnesia story. Simply put, he's had a traumatic brain injury and he has lost um, some functionality and a vast deal of memory um, and a little bit of his personality, which happens. Uh, so I wanted an image that was just empty because that's how he feels. He feels empty. And I could have just said he felt so empty and she filled him up. Eh, okay, but haven't we read that a hundred times? I think we have. So we want something different. We want something that's going to give us this strong visual imagery that's going to reveal his state of mind. He's describing the kiss, but he's revealing himself. Let's go on. Touch. Next slide. She was soft so indecently, incongruously, surprisingly soft when all the rest of her seemed to be made up of wickedly sharp angles. Oh, he does not want to want this girl. He thinks she's wicked. He could have said, oh, this wicked girl, I don't want to want her. This is so much more fun. He's describing his first kiss with her and he is struggling with not wanting her, but wanting her. And this is how he reveals it. Lots of uh, rhetorical devices going on here to tell our little brain, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. And she's wicked, wicked shop, as our Massachusetts friends would say, wicked shop. She's wicked sharp to him. He's gonna get cut, y'all. It's gonna get cut pretty bad. It's gonna be loads of fun, I promise. Okay, let's go on to the next. Physical reaction. Now, this is one we really, really, really want in our books. This is important. This is why people come to romance. They want some of this reaction between the two protagonists or three or whatever, whomever, doesn't matter. Between an AI and a person. All good. Let's see our first one. This is from Janet Ivanovich's Hot Six. Always makes me laugh. Most women would have an orgasm on the spot to find Joe Morelli sitting in their car. He had that effect. I'd known Morelli most of my life and I almost never had an on the spot orgasm. I needed at least four minutes. So much fun going on here. She's describing Joe Morelli sitting in her car, but he has that effect. She's got lots of fun things. Orgasm on the spot, on the spot orgasm. I needed at least four minutes. The same kind of, well, in this case, it's a kind of a combination of that wisecracking, but also self-deprecating humor that uh, Stephanie Plum has throughout this entire series. And this push-pull between is Joe Morelli going to give Cupcake an orgasm or not? lasts throughout the entire series. It's what's going to happen in these books. It's so much fun. I love the geriatric chihuahua. Yes. So think of this. Oh, the color purple is humor. It's kind of my, some authors write funny and it's super hard to do. And I am not one of those authors, but I always kind of put humor in as purple because it's it's revealing, it reveals character. Humor is a character trait. It's also a voice for an author, but uh, only funny voiced authors can write those kinds of funny characters, like Plum, like Charlie in the first Grave series, like our diner owner in Catch of the Day, Kristen Higgins books. Some authors have that gift, so I put it in purple. Is that an answer? We good? We getting up? Okay. What else have we got? Next. Okay, this is great. Sorry, that was my computer going off. God, he was sexy. Not just in that haywire, pheromone way. 
after Go with Cherry Adair. We met our protagonist hero, male protagonist, who was the stuntman ex-military. But here is our female protagonist's point of view. She is a chemist. Look at that. Fabulous. Really tight writing. Only a chemist would think of her reaction to a man as that pheromone reaction. Only a chemist or a scientist of some sort, but a chemist. This gets right to the heart of who she is as a person, her entire experience, her career, her backstory. Tight writing. There's just three power words here. It's perfect for this kind of thriller. God, sexy, haywire. Haywire as a power word also has this marvelous connotation of being out of control. Is she going to be able to control her reaction to this man? Ooh. Is it going to be fun? Yes. Yes, it is. And isn't that why we all read romance? Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, very different tone. This is from a, sort of a procedural thriller, Tana French in the Woods, Irish Cop. And I always read this in an Irish accent, and I'm very sorry. I'll try not to. She wasn't my type. I've always liked girly girls, sweet, tiny, bird bone girls I can pick up and whirl around in a one-armed hug. But there was something about her, maybe, the way she stood, weight on one hip, straight and easy as a gymnast. Maybe just the mystery. This is our cop looking at his newly assigned uh, partner and seeing something different, right? This is, in, it's not a romance. It's a procedural mystery thriller. But still, the way the characters see each other and see that something, there was something about her. We're going to, he's going to spend the entire story trying to figure out the mystery of why he's attracted to her because he's not what he's describing here is what she is not she's not a girly girl she's not sweet she's not tiny she's not bird boned he likes harmless girls that says a lot about him doesn't it girls he can whirl around girls he can control harmless girls he can control is she that? She is the opposite. There's something about her. He doesn't know yet what that is, but there it is. It's those things. She is not going to let him push her around, whirl her around, control her. There you go. Tana French, brilliant. If you write thrillers, if you love thrillers, read Tana French. Adore. All right, let's go to the next. Emotions. Okay, we have to wrap up that section first. Use all your senses. Use all of your character's senses to describe the experience they're having in the book to reveal their character, reveal their backstory, reveal their thoughts, reveal their struggle. So next, what we want to look at especially, especially in a romance novel, but in other genres also, are our emotions. I'm going to take a quick drink of water, and everybody should do the same. Quick, quick. Okay. The emotions and the emotional experience of your novel, well, it's why people come to novels in the first place, to share the protagonist's emotions and experiences from the safe distance of the book. So let's go to the next slide. We're going to reveal your character through their emotion. Next, what we want to do is we want to take a universal emotion, all of the things that we all experience, fear, joy, uneasiness, angst, pain, you name it, and we're going to go through a batch of them. Those are universal to all of us. We want to show it in a visceral way. A visceral way is the uncontrolled physical reaction that happens in a human's body in experience, uh, when experiencing emotion, when experiencing joy, I cry, when experiencing uh, fear, the I start shaking and the hair on my arm stands up, when I experience anger, 
I get red and hot and I feel like I'm just going to melt. Those are visceral, uncontrollable reactions. And the way we describe those, we want to make it unique to your character, to their backstory, to their experience, to their thoughts, and where they are in the story. So that is the big deal with emotions. Universal emotions expressed viscerally in a way that is unique to your character. Sounds like a lot to do. It's not as hard as it looks. Let's go. Nerves. Next. His insides were fisted up tighter than a Turk's head knot. And later on in the book, now that his brain had finally caught up with his gut, recognition roared through him like a wayward cannon shot. Okay, so your uh, protagonist, their guts or their tummy, if they're not a guts kind of person, are fisted up or are knotted up tighter than what is the thing in their world. In this Royal Navy story, a Turk's head knot is kind of a little bollard at the end of a line. It's just this little tight knot that can't be undone. It's used to throw things. A Turk's head knot. It's just a tight, balled up little thing. You don't even know, need to know specifically what a Turk's head knot is to know. It's a knot. It's a nautical knot. Fine. That's all you need to know. It's described in a way that's unique to his world. And now that his brain had finally caught up with his gut, recognition roared through him like, what would it roar through with your protagonist? Because this is a Royal Navy guy that in his gut is like a cannon. Boom. What would it be in your protagonist's world? What would it be in, uh, maybe you're writing a cultured lady pianist. I have this elsewhere in my examples in your handout. But a, a I don't know, an arpeggio would be appropriate for that kind of a person. What's the specific thing that you can think of in your protagonist's world that you can tie this visceral, visceral gut reaction to? In this case, wayward cannon shot. Works because he's Royal Navy. We know he's on a Royal Navy ship. We know. And at this point, there's going to be cannons shot off of the metaphorical and the actual kind. Okay. Moving to the next. His ears pricked up instantly and sent a cold message to his gut like a douse of icy seawater. Again, I write these Royal Navy guys. They're who I know. I was a nautical archeologist all my research for all those years. That's why I know these guys. And the guys are the same as the guys today. Royal, Na Royal Navy, SEALs, they're the same guy the uniform changes. That's about it. Anyway, a douse of icy seawater. Nobody but this guy who's been on the Royal Navy ship. Okay, maybe a merchant marine also, a douse of icy seawater. You wouldn't describe it that way to somebody who was not that Royal Navy guy. You would say his ears pricked up and sent a cold message to his gut like a winter storm. I don't know. Or the lobster man. Ah, in Kristen Higgins's Catch of the Day, the lobster man might also have a douse of icy seawater. It could work for him, right? Not for the people who live in town, only for him. Okay, let's look at the next. Back to Afterglow. Seeing her made something inside him go still like the quiet before a storm. He felt the impact of those familiar peridot-colored eyes like a physical blow to his solar plexus. A bomb of suppressed emotions exploded in his chest and splintered through him like shrapnel. Doesn't work for anybody who's not a stuntman. He's taken blows to his solar plexus. We know that he knows what a physical blow to his solar plexus feels like but he's ex-military, so we get bomb, shrapnel, exploded. Yeah, he's probably been around some bombs exploding. Can we have access to this handout? Yes, definitely. Everybody can, who's on here will definitely get access. There, she's put up the link for you now. And there's more in the handout, trust me. <laughs> okay, let's go to the next. Aren't they wonderful? Thank you, Hannah and Megan and Morgan, keeping everything going over there. 
I paced the room, feeling like ants were crawling around inside my shirt. This is The Lightning Thief by Rick Reardon. Middle grade adventure story. I love this particular one because we're really... Reardon has done something really special here with this kid. Because he's saying he's antsy. But he's giving you this very direct answer crawling around inside my shirt. You get the antsy, but you're also getting what it feels like to be in the skin of a kid with ADHD, which is something that uh, Reardon deals with and specifically wrote this book to deal with, to write a protagonist who felt this way. It's really brilliant, very direct, very... Um, yeah, direct, I guess, is what I would say, what you want in middle grade. It's not far flung. Kids get this. It's right there on the page for them. Ants are crawling around inside my shirt. He's antsy, but it's very visceral. It's very, it gives me the heebie-jeebies. But it puts us inside the skin of this kid who's got ADHD. Brilliant. Let's go to the next. Elspeth's heart began to clatter like the off-balance spinning wheel in the corner of the parlor. Everything within her was afraid and aghast and exhilarated all at the same time. And a little later, relief and excitement made a tangled skein of her insides. So yes, yeah, she's feeling that same thing in her gut, but she is this quiet spinster, literally a spinster, in rural Scotland, and there's an off-balance spinning wheel in the corner of the parlor. That's what's in the room where it happens, where she is. That's how her heart is clattering. Only a provincial, rural spinster with very limited opportunities would think of her heart clattering like an off-balance spinning wheel. And I kept all of the other illusions to her like this, a tangled skein. We can see the ball of yarn just all tangled up inside her. Very simple, but it reveals her character, her backstory, her thoughts, and where she is in her life. Nobody else but a spinster like this, literally a spinster, it's where the world comes from, can describe her emotions like this. Okay, let's go to the next. Joy! Joy is a fun one. We like to have lots of joy. It's why we come to romance to get some joy in this world. Next, this is back to Tana French, and there's not a lot of joy in that book, so let's look at it. The wood had never seemed so lush or so feral. Leaves threw off dazzles of sunlight like sparklers, and the odors were so bright you could live on them. The smell of fertile earth amplified to something heady as church wine. I could probably also take this and put it in setting at the beginning because he is describing literally the wood in the woods. But he's describing how it makes him feel to be back in this particular wood. To solve a murder, it brings up echoes of a murder that happened in this protagonist's childhood. So there's a mystery within a mystery happening here, but only an Irish person or a Catholic person would describe this wood and the smells and the sunlight as something as heady as church wine. Gives us background, it gives us depth, it gives us culture. It's marvelous. Let's go to the next. There was a man plastered all along the length of Antigone's back, a tall, warm, living, breathing man whose heat was seeping through the intervening layers of her clothing until she felt as toasty and soft as a buttered piece of bread. Absolutely lovely. So country girl in a Regency, it's not that complicated. I just wanted something soft and she's melting. And I didn't want to say she's melting because I thought it might be a little icky. So she's as toasty and soft as a buttered piece of bread, right? One of my Royal Navy heroes or the, Royal, the protagonist, the girl who is on the Royal Navy ship would never think of herself as toasty and soft as a buttered piece of bread. Wouldn't fit. This describes only this particular character. She reveals herself this way. You know me. This is our amnesia story. The thought gripped him tighter than the binding around his head and ribs. This is pretty direct. 
This is from the room where it happens and the experience that has just happened to him. He has been beaten within an inch of his life. He has a traumatic brain injury. He doesn't know who he is. So the thought of finding out who he is is visceral. It is gripping him tighter than the thing that is actually gripping him, which are the bindings that he's all trussed up in because we don't have x-rays in the Regency. <laughs> We have, uh, it looks pretty bad. Hope you get better. Glad to live today. Glad to live today. But he reveals what's happened to him. Okay, next. Thank you. Sorry, you can go back. Oh, Talk Sweetly to Me by Courtney Milan. I love this story of a young woman who is literally a calculator. She is a mathematical genius solving, uh, let's call it physics mathematics for the person who gets all the credit. She does the equations. He gets this, the, the glory. Anyway, his smile felt like an arrow, one that struck her straight in the solar plexus. So here we have solar plexus, just like our uh, stunt man. And it made sense for our stunt man, but it makes sense for this particular a uh, young woman in this book because she is scientific and she has studied and she knows the things that ordinary people in the Regency would not know. It's part of her genius that she has, uh, she works for a professor basically, and she has access to this kind of knowledge and learning. It doesn't work on anybody else in the Regency who would not have access to that learning, wouldn't have this particular backstory. It's very direct. His smile was like an arrow that struck her straight in the solar plexus. Also, listen to all that rhetorical device. Struck straight solar. Smile. Not four. Smile struck straight solar. You don't notice it until afterwards, do you? Your readers won't notice it either. You can make the sausage. Trust me. Let's go on. Oh, I love this book too. You can tell what I love because these examples are all from everything I love. This is from Laura Kinsale's Little Red Lessons in French. Brilliant, brilliant book. Love it. Trev felt such a rush of love that it was almost a pain in his chest and throat. He had to grip his bruised hand into a fist and drown the feeling in sharp physical hurt, mill it down like an opponent in a brutal match. So this is a, a bad boy hero who has come back after having abandoned, it seems like, the heroine years before. And we don't know what he's been doing. The rush of love he feels. So that's a lovely thing. That's a very romance thing. That's a very poignant thing, a rush of love. But to him, it's a pain like an opponent in a brutal match. He's been doing off license or guess, you know, um, bare knuckle boxing promotion. He's been running illegal games. He is an illegal gamester. He's come back and he's pretending to be one thing. But this little description at the end of his rush of love reveals his backstory in a way that we have not found out before in the book and the heroine doesn't know yet. So this is a case of she, the reader, no, the writer, the writer is giving, revealing information to the reader that the other characters don't know about yet. That revelation is doubly important, right? Trev, he's being revealed here, but he's revealing it to the reader and they're getting information that the other character doesn't have. That's really special to do. Okay, let's go to the next. Sorrow. We don't like this. We don't really like to dwell on it in our romances, but sorrow must visit us all. Let's go. Back to the Goose Girl by Shannon Hale. Oh, how much I love this. The princess sat on a stone, rested her arm on the back of a swan, and thought how her chest felt like a gutted walnut shell and wondered if that sensation might last forever. 
Oh, this breaks my heart every time. This poor little princess. Well, she's not really, well, she's about to, everything's about to get taken away from her. And she's empty. Her father, the king, has just died. And we all know what happens to princesses when the king dies. Bad things, bad things happen. But she's resting her arm on the back of a swan. She can talk to the animals. The animals can feel what she feels. She can feel what they feel. But her chest felt like a gutted walnut shell. Oh, you get this hard, brittle, wrinkled, shriveled, brittle little image in your mind. And she wonders if this sensation will last forever. Oh my God, it's killing me. No, no, it won't last forever. You as the reader, me as the reader, I am telling, oh, it won't last forever. It won't last forever. Let me turn the page to make sure it doesn't last forever. Let me make sure. That's what we want. That's why we share these emotions because the reader experiences them and shares them. So important. Yes, great book. Agree, agree. Just adore it so much. All of Shannon Hale. If you write middle grade, read everything she's written. I promise you'll learn so much. Okay, next. Again, every word they spoke seemed to empty any more, like buckets dipped into a shallow well. They're yammering at her, they're coming after her. And it's a fairy tale, right? So here we are at the fairy tale wishing well, only that's not what's happening. She's being emptied, buckets dipped into a shallow well. Such beautiful, strong visual imagery, but it's revealing her state of mind. It's perfectly appropriate. It's the room where it happens, so to speak, in a fairy tale. Uh, it's very direct. There's not a lot of, it's happening to Annie right there in this moment. It's perfect for middle grade. It's just lovely. So let's keep going through our checklist, right? Universal emotions visceral, every word they spoke is emptying her more, but in a way that is unique to the character in a fairy tale, buckets dipped into a shallow well. Perfect. Next, pain, we don't like it. Again, like our sorrow, pain's not good, but it gives us a lot of room for growth. And especially if you write adventuresome things like I do, I tend to put my, um, protagonists in challenging spaces, into adventures, into the Battle of Trafalgar. Why not? It's there. Next. I always say this word wrong, and somebody had to correct me in a lecture once. I used to say in choate, but it's inchoate relief made drawing his next breath easier than the last, though the pain sat like a granite boulder on his chest, immovable. So this is our amnesia story in the highlands of Scotland. The pain is immovable. It sits like a granite boulder on his chest because all of his world around him is granite. Uh, if you are writing some sort of modern stunt man, uh, or like a, I put this in the handout, like a CrossFit fanatic, it's gonna sit on his chest like a monster truck tire, right? What is the thing in your protagonist's world that's going to sit on their chest like? Take all of these examples and kind of pull them apart. Now, don't plagiarize them. I hope that doesn't need to be said. But understand the lesson. Pull things apart and take the piece or the setup that you can use. Ask yourself, what is the only thing in your protagonist's world. How would they describe pain on their chest? Universal, visceral, unique to your protagonist. Okay, next. First grave again, Dorinda Jones. Oh, so funny, love it. A jolt of pain ripped through me, reminding me that I'd been beaten senseless the night before. In too much pain to stretch, I let a lengthy yawn overtake me instead, wincing at the soreness through to shooting through my jaw. Then looked back at dead guy. He was blurry, not because he was dead, but because it was 4.30 a.m. and I'd recently had my ass kicked. So again, this is the Grim Reaper who cannot die, but she is in this human embodiment. 
that feels all the things, but just heals very quickly. So she kind of knows that even though she's got jolts of pain, it's going to be okay tomorrow. She'll be healed by then. But she reveals, this is at the very beginning of the book, it reveals that she can see dead guys, the dead guy sitting on her couch. That's not, that's, hello, where are we? Who are you? What? It's all sorts of fun. Right at the beginning of the novel, it reveals that she's not like us. She can see dead guys and she's very funny, even at 4.30 a.m. and having her ass kicked. That's why that's in purple, because it's this wisecracking stuff. Fabulous, Dorinda. Okay, we're going to have a series of little hangovers. She felt as if her head were being pounded in by a caulking mallet. This is my girl on a Royal Navy ship. You don't even know, need to know what a caulking mallet is. You get it in context. It's a mallet. Her head's being pounded in. That is in the room where it happens for her. Only a girl on a Royal Navy ship would describe a hangover as being like the pounding of a caulking mallet. Let's quickly look at the next. Here's Kristen Higgins' catch of the day, our girl who owns a diner. I'm sorry if I didn't put that up. The girl looking for clean, solid, and strong. Fragments of last night whiz around in my brain like ice being crushed in a blender. My brain grinds against my skull, and apparently my right eye has an ice pick in it. The room where it happens for her is her diner. All of these things, this exact same experience, the visceral experience of having a hangover to the last person, but it's expressed uniquely through her protagonist's experience. In the room where it happens, there are blenders and ice picks in the cooler. It's perfect. Only somebody who owns a diner, works in a diner, etc., etc., thinks of it this way. Only somebody on a ship thinks of it as a caulking mallet. It's fabulous. What is it in your protagonist's world? Why, how do they feel when their head is pounding from a hangover? Like what? Think of that. Okay, let's go to the next. It was if a same thing. Again, we're having another one. Uh, another hangover. We've read a lot of hangovers. It was if all the remarkable and horrible and interesting and life-changing things that had happened to her over the long course of the night hit her all at once, like a cricket bat to the back of her head. She's a country girl who grew up in a family of brothers. She's taken a cricket bat to the back of the head before. It's very simple. It's from the room where it happens for her experience in a historical. Perfect. Let's look at the next. Oh, emotions, embarrassment or unease. How are we doing on time? We're doing okay. We've got a half an hour or so left. We're gonna get through this. Are y'all still with me? Are your brains glazing over? Don't worry. Just keep thinking this way. Just keep looking at these examples. Reread them over in the, uh, hang in the hangover, in the handout and you'll get the hang of it. You'll build a mindset. Okay, give us a thumbs up, okay? <laughs> Let's look at unease and embarrassment next. Embarrassing, yes, but strangely enlightening as well. I'd never been KO'd before. I thought it would hurt more. Somehow when you're knocked senseless, the pain doesn't show up till later, and then it's a cold, heartless bitch. So we've got two things here. We've got embarrassment and we've got the pain, but in Dorinda's Character, Charlie, we get this wise cracking, strangely enlightening, embarrassing, but strangely enlightening. I would have thought it would have hurt more, but it doesn't because she's the Grim Reaper. Only the Grim Reaper and only this particular character would wise crack about the pain being, <laughs> the pain that she's experiencing being a cold, heartless bitch. It's a lot of fun. Love that. Next. Again. Shifting back to Ray's, I decided to get the embarrassing part out of the way. I've decided to get the embarrassing part out of the way, I said. Best to get these things out in the open. It's a marvelous little juxtaposition here, but only this kind of an open, uh, funny character would immediately come out and say the thing they're not going to say. I've decided to get the embarrassing part out in the open. It's a lot of fun. It reveals 
the humor in the character in only that that only this character has this wise cracking sense of humor so hope some of you write humor out there because it's a brilliant way to show character and i can't do it so i admire it vastly next scandal in the night oh we're gonna have a talk about this in just a second she pulled away abruptly and pressed her hand to her throat, stumbling a little sideways, as if her world were tilting off its upright, starched axis. So this is a story about uh, a second chance. Uh, protagonists have been separated by time and space, and he has finally come back to where she is in England. And she is a governess now, all starch. And he doesn't want her to be starchy anymore. But so she's, oh my God, embarrassed. And she kind of tilts a little as if her world were falling off its upright starched axis. But it's also telling us uh, her world is about to change vastly now that this man is back in it. She's recognized him after years away. So here's the thing we're gonna talk about. I love this story. And obviously I'm proud of the writing in it. I think it has lots of great writing in it. But I wrote this story a really long time ago and essentially it is a colonizer story. It is about English people in England. I mean, sorry, I just said that all wrong. It's about English people in India. It is about uh, the period bef of the English East India Company as they are starting to take control of the country. Now that's probably not a story that's mine to tell. And I think I did a good job of it. I think I wrote a story that acknowledges the evils of colonialism and the hardships, but still, this is a story that some people might find harm in. And it's not a story that I'm gonna keep out there in the world. I have the rights back to this story now, and so I'm not republishing it. So I keep it in here for two reasons. One, because I think we can learn something from the writing itself. And two, because I think we can learn that no matter how well written something is, sometimes it's not a story we should be telling, or it's not a story we should keep out there in the world. So the only parts of this story you're ever gonna get are the little snippets we're gonna learn from because it shouldn't come out and it's gonna stay away. Okay, off my soapbox, but we can learn two things here at the same time. I have faith in all of you. Okay, next. Oh, another one of my favorite stories ever, The Witch of Blackbird Pond. It's sort of a foundational story for me uh, by Elizabeth George Spear, middle grade, uh, verging on YA, but it's sort of a sixth grade, sixth grade, it's a Newbery book, so sixth grade, right? Her spirits bobbed like the whitecaps in the harbor as the boat pulled away from the black hull of the dolphin. Very direct, what's happening here is she is bobbing like what's happening in the room where it happens. She's in a little boat going to the shore for the first time. She is arriving in New England. She is a fish out of water and she is, oh my goodness. It's very direct. It's very appropriate for middle grade. It's right there in the room where it happens, but it's something visceral. It's a universal emotion, visceral. Her spirits are bobbing. She's kind of got off, uh, but it's unique to this particular character and her situation in the room where it happens for her. Let's look at the next. Uh, back to the lightning thief, love this. I have moments like that a lot when my brain falls asleep or something. And the next thing I know I've missed something as if a puzzle piece fell out of the universe and left me staring at the blank space behind. Only a kid with ADHD could describe this sort of unease or, uh, you know, what we would call a brain fart, I guess, in this way. Only a kid with ADHD would have this sense of disassociation and dislocation 
Uh, you know, maybe my character with a brain injury might have had that kind of a dislocation or disassociation. But this is very appropriate, a puzzle piece, just a puzzle piece. But look at these words he's using, fell out of the universe. We don't know it yet in this story, and yet at this place in the story, but this protagonist is the son of an Olympian, an Olympic god, part of the universe. All sorts of fabulous little subtext there. A puzzle piece fell out of the universe. He's telling us what's happening, that this kid is a puzzle piece falling out of the universe. Brilliant! Go Rick Reardon! Read all his books. Have your kids read his books. Get your libraries to have all of his books. Let's go to the next. Frustration. We're getting close. We're almost to the end. We're getting frustrated. We're getting tired too, but frustrated. Okay, next. So why did we, Quince Winthrop's opinion of him, sting so much like a tiny but biting nettle working its way under his skin? What is the thing in your protagonist's world that is small and worrisome and just annoying enough? Well, if you live in the UK, in the country, and if you've ever walked through a field of nettles, there you go. It's working its way under your skin. It's a visceral that's tied to his experience in the room where it happens, the world where he is. Let's look at the next. Another sting, but in a very different way. Also from Scandal in the Night. This is our hero uh, who has been an undercover agent in uh, what we would now call Pakistan. The news of the new resident commissioner had stung like the venom from the bees high in the Himalayan caves, a small but lasting hurt. So it's describing the exact same thing we saw in that last example of the stinging nettle working its way under his skin. It's a small but lasting hurt. But here he just describes it in a way that is unique to his backstory, having lived um, and traversed the Himalaya for, well, his almost his entire life. He has been there since he's been 12. And he's, I don't know how old he is at this point in the story, let's say 28. So he's spent his adult and formative years in this place. So all of his references, even though he is in England, come from this backstory. Make sense? Everybody got that? Okay, not seeing any more questions. So don't hold back on the questions. We'll have some time at the end. I think I'm checking. Yep, yeah, we're good. Dread. We're almost at the end. We're at the dread. Next. The dread. The sudden dread in his chest weighed him down like a can cannonball in a canvas stroud. It's a really little novella, The Difference One Duke Makes, where our... Uh, Permanently disabled hero comes back from the Royal Navy and is uh, in England um, with his family again, and he hates it. Um, and he's just finding out some very bad news. The sudden dread in his chest weighs him down like a cannonball in a canvas shroud. That's what happens when you die in the Royal Navy. They stitch you up in a shroud and they weight it with a cannonball and off the side you go. That's how he's weighted down. Only somebody with his experience, having been most of his life in the Royal Navy, and he was a, let's say, a secondary character in a couple of other books, in Almost a Scandal, in A Breath of Scandal. So lots of scandal in this poor fellow's life. But only this guy, only a Royal Navy guy, would the dread would be like a cannonball in a shroud. What would the dread be in your protagonist's life? What would weigh them down? Next. Swoony. We come to this. We've got to have lots of swoony, right? We come to our romance for the swoony. Let's go. Next. She felt breathless and light, suspended almost, as if the earth had ceased to exert its pull upon her and ceded all its gravity to Viscount Darling. So this is my uh, self-taught scientist. She has just, in the scene prior, been to a lecture uh, by Caroline Herschel at the Royal Academy talking about uh, planets and the solar system. And I think it was Uranus or Uranus. I don't know how to say that planet. It's still a planet. There you go. 
That is why in she, this particular self-taught scientist, gets to cede her gravity to Viscount Darling. She's just, oh my goodness, she's getting there with him. Yeah, she's going to cede it all. She's definitely ceding all her gravity. Next. This is our Royal Navy ship, almost a scandal. He sent another long sideways look her way, and just like that, the deck seemed to rise under her feet and tilt her towards Mr. Collier. Same emotion as, as we saw in the last, but expressed in a way that is unique to this character who is living aboard the ship, who is trying to be seen as a competent professional, and uh, the deck is just coming up under her feet and tilting her towards Kim. The lieutenant, she just can't help herself. She has going to go full tilt towards Mr. Collier. Definitely. Let's look at the next. He shook his head and smiled all at the same time. The effect made a hot pot de creme of her brain. Uh, this little mad for love is a novella with a French emigre heroine who has escaped the terror in France and come to London. And you don't even need to know what a pot de creme is. You get it from context that he's just made her feel whew, all hot and bubbly inside. Thank you very much. I think she's going to drink the full pot de creme. Definitely. Next. Oh, I love this, An Extraordinary Union by Alyssa Cole. Elle prided herself on never having fainted, but the world started to go dim around the edges. And although it was a cool spring afternoon, she was sweating like it was midday on the plantation in Georgia. I, I don't even have to tell you what this book is about and you understand it already. This is at the very opening of the book, and uh, our protagonist has been uh, trying to evade somebody in the street. She is a code, I don't know, we're gonna call her a code breaker or she's carrying ciphers, she's carrying codes and she's trying to elude somebody. But we get all of her backstory, boom, right in this very visceral moment. It's universal, it's going dim around the edges, it's in her body so we can feel it, visceral, but it's expressed in a way that's unique. Only this character would feel like it was midday on a plantation in Georgia, even though it's a cool spring afternoon. That's her backstory. Look at how brilliant that is. It's just one little paragraph. Love it. The book's full of it, full of brilliant things like this, full of character you don't forget. Let's move on. Back to the Lawrence Brown affair. Then Radner flashed him one of his rare smiles and Georgie felt simultaneous like, simultaneously like he had been given a precious gift and like he had been hit in the head with a shovel. Fabulous, right? A precious gift and somebody who grew up in the streets and who we now know was a pickpocket hit in the back of the head like a shovel. Somebody's hit Georgie before with a shovel. So this is that rare thing. This is a, a smile. Hits him like a shovel to the back of the head. It's appropriate for a Regency. It's visceral. It's unique to this character's backstory. All the check marks. Let's go to the next. Oh, we're back to lessons in French. Now, we talked about our hero in this, our pro male protagonist in this book uh, was our boxing, our secret boxing promoter who is a bad boy who's been away for years. This is the girl he has left behind, and she is seeing him for the first time. She is, uh, well, we'll see. Her heart and breath felt as if they had deserted her, declaring they were off to join the Navy and might come back to visit in a few years if she were lucky. Her heart's gone away and might come back if she's lucky. Literally, her heart, the man she loves, has come back and this is how he makes her feel. Now, this is a very shy, retiring country uh, heroine 
female protagonist. She is quiet and tongue-tied and she just never knows what to do. She just goes along with this hero when they were kids, but now that he is back, she is tongue-tied. But in the years he's been away to deal with her shyness, she has created elaborate little stories in her head, and this is an example of them. Only this particular character would sort of go off on this little flight of fancy, but it's a flight of fancy that tells us exactly how she feels about him. She has felt deserted. Her heart has gone away, and now it has come back, and she is lucky but she doesn't know what to do about it. She's just all done in. I love this. It's quite brilliant. It seems so. It's like a souffle, but if you've ever baked a souffle, oh my God, it's so hard to get this light touch. I just love this book so much. Okay, next. How are we doing on time? We're great, we're great. We have 15 minutes left, perfect. Fear, quick, quick, let's go through our fear. Next, she had told herself she had the heart of oak of every true British sailor, but in that moment, she wished she had a heart of stone. She's in the thick of it now. She's in way over her head, and the battle has started. Only a girl who thought she wanted to be on a Royal Navy ship, who thought she could do all the things, that she could be that person, that she could be the true British sailor, would reveal herself this way. She's in way over her head. She is just about to be done in. It's going to be bad. And then it'll be better because it's a romance novel. It's going to be fine. Let's look at the next one. Mad for Love. This is our French émigré, right? She had to make him understand the hot press of panic beating against her ears. It was as if she could hear the dull roar of the mob outside her uncle's house in Paris and feel the house shake and the windows shatter as bricks and cobbles smashed against it. So she's sort of having a PTSD moment. We understand that in our modern parlance, but we wouldn't, there's no words for that in the Regency. We just have this. She is experiencing the physical symptoms of her fear, even though it happened a long time ago. But she expresses it, only this girl, this emigre who had lived through the mobs in Paris would feel this way when there's this big sound that happens in the situation in the plot. They're stealing something. It's going wrong. There you go. Only this character would express this universal press of panic in this way. Next, sexual awareness. Yes, yes please. Let's go back to our chemist, right? The surge of raw emotion flooded her system, anger, grief, fear. It was an unhealthy cocktail. And I'm sorry, my dogs are barking. I don't know what is outside. Um, only a chemist would express this pumping of raw emotion into her. Nobody else would call it a system, right? A surge, system, anger, grief, fear. It was an unhealthy cocktail, a chemical cocktail. And then the caustic edge of his tone ate at her like acid. Only a chemist. Only a chemist talks about how a man makes her feel like that. We could put that back into voice and we would get the same thing, but she's tying two things together here. So I'm putting it in emotion. So you can see them together and see that Cherry has done this throughout this book. It's not just a one-off. These things are consistent throughout the book. Next. That thought back to the Lawrence Brown affair, a male male regency, that thought or historical, that thought sent unwanted sparks of desire through his body, like so much electricity coursing through copper wires, only more dangerous. So um, Lawrence Brown is a mad inventor in this book. And this is uh, how only this inventor, and he's trying to invent a sort of a battery but there are copper wires. There are literally copper wires in the house where he's trying to build this thing, or they're in a trench outside, actually, where he's trying to build this thing. This unwanted attraction and an unwanted spark 
only somebody working with electricity, only somebody trying to invent something, only this mad inventor would express his desire, a universal thing we all feel like this, as electricity coursing through him, only more dangerous. It's marvelous. Love this book. Next, pity. And we're almost at the end because we don't want too much pity in our books. It's a drowning emotion. Pity, like a hard lump sat cold in Georgie's belly. And now we know at this point in the story that Georgie has been a pickpocket. Georgie has been deprived in his life. But he still feels pity for his betters. The, the I don't know, I can't remember what Lawrence Brown's uh, title is in this particular book. Let's just call him the mad inventor. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a visceral, it's hard lump in his belly because we know at this point that only this character in this story has been empty and felt that kind of hunger, that it's pity. Okay, let's see, next slide, where are we? And talk about the handout really quickly and come on with your questions anytime. Here are the other things that are covered in your handouts. Secondary characters, the way your protagonist sees and interacts with secondary characters should also reveal them. And I've given you a lot of examples there. I like to use secondary characters for some sort of more, a little slightly more outrageous uh, descriptions and metaphors. It's just more fun. And you can do that with secondary characters. We can also reveal character through dialogue and dialect. Grain of salt. Be careful with dialogue and dialect. I'm sure you, like me, have read those Scottish books that we love where you've got to sound it out, all the achs and veras and it is and I, and you have, it's like a phonics chart. We don't want that. I give you lots of examples, especially from Joanna Bourne's uh, Spy Master series, because she has protagonists who are native French speakers, and she never devolves to zizo, zazi, zazi, zu, but you get the cadence of a French speaker in the way she structures her sentences. So dialogue and dialect both reveal character. The next section is going to be rhetorical devices. A lot of what you've already seen is going to be covered in those sections, but I want you to note specifically the sausage making. See what they're doing to make their reader's brain say, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. This is important. You're going to want to remember this. It's especially, even if you don't write romance, rhetorical devices are marvelous when you're laying clues boning out things and uh, giving red herrings. Pay attention, pay attention, pay attention, maybe. Mysteries, so really important there. In the last section that we can chat about and we can talk about in uh, the chat is going to the well, where to get these. Now, I'm a big believer in subtext. I am a big believer in letting your subconscious do the work in the first draft. I'm also a huge believer in redrafting and rewriting. And sometimes I'll just write something because I have to get the bloody draft done. You've all been there. But when I'm coming back through revisions, I know the characters better, or I know like in A Sense of Sin that I've got this lion imagery going. What word can I pick that's going to reinforce that? Maybe I'll use feral. Maybe I'll use wild. Maybe I'll put in tawny. I don't know. But I can reinforce and pick words that are going to reinforce the character I already know in my third draft, right? I can also reinforce subtext. I can also... Uh, go back and find uh, a simile for the word that I've already used that's going to give me more cadence or more alliteration. So don't think that you have to come right out of your brain and put this on the page. What you're seeing here are people's finished 
edited, copy edited, developmentally edited. I think we could use more of this or that. 15 other people's eyes have seen all of these examples before I brought them to you tonight, right? So don't think you need to get them coming out of the gate. Give yourself the luxury of writing the wrong word and come back to it and revise and look for opportunities where you can put in and reveal more character. Okay. I think I saw some, how do you dig deeper for characters when they're stubborn in their draft and they won't open up? Oh, I hear you. Oh my God. I am, I am an archeologist. I write books the same way I did archeology. span I don't know what's underneath. I've got a vague idea. I've done some of my research. I've got an idea of what's gonna happen. And I dig down and what happened here in this place, in my grid square, becomes clearer the deeper I go. So when I'm writing my first draft and I really don't know the characters, I'll write the cliche. I will. I'll just do it. I'll put it on the paper because I'll know I'll want to get something he's, uh, you know, as dumb as a hammer. Uh, he's just like a, as dumb as a bag of rocks. I don't know. And then later I'll think, wait, that's a cliche. Where is this character from? What is he like? Where has he been all his life? What is the dumbest thing in his world? What's the drunkest thing in his world? What's the most painful or revealing thing in his world? You can come back to it. Let them reveal themselves to you. This is, again, fourth draft, final, this is printed book, right? I have them all on my shelves here. This is printed book stuff. Keep working at it. Give yourself some room to grow with your characters and get to know them. But also know that it's your job by that third and fourth draft to dig into their backstory, to look around the room where it happens, to reveal them in words that nobody else would use. That's your job. Go at it slow, but get at it. Okay, where else? What else can we do? Thank you for that question, Rebecca. That was marvelous. Uh, love Jorinda. Uh, lots of love for Jorinda here. Anybody else have some questions? We're, we're three minutes, y'all, three. Or if we're European, three. Yeah. Get those, get those questions in, you guys. This is like once-in-a-lifetime so, opportunity. <laughs> there's a lot. I mean, look, I have my, my pages here. This has taken me years to figure out. Some of it I did pretty instinctively because I read a lot in the beginning. And I tried to write like the authors I loved, like Laura Kinsale. I wanted to write like Laura Kinsale. So um, thank you, Denise. Okay. I, I can't read and talk at the same time. Me either. And anyway, you know, see the authors you want to emulate. See how they do this. I think now that you, this, this class is a little bit about how the sausage is made and it kind of ruins some things for us because now you're like, oh, I see the trick she used there. Oh, sneaky backloading alliteration. I see you but you can do it too. And your readers won't see that. Your readers will just be breathless with what's happening to your characters. Trust me, I promise. Yes, you do. It's a lot to digest, Catherine. I, it's taken me years, but that's why I've given you, I don't know, 20 odd pages of handout. Come back and visit it again. Think about it when you're reading and find examples in the authors that you love the most. And um, just keep at it. What you're gonna do, what we want to do is build a mindset so that even if you can't come up with the right word on that first draft and you put down the cliche, you know it's an opportunity for you to reveal character that you're gonna come back to 
and you're going to trust your subconscious and you're going to trust your craft and trust that you're going to come up with the right word that's unique to your character. Thank you for those kind words, Deborah. One of my, we went to Scotland together. It was the most fun ever. Oh my God. I want to go back right now. I, Anything I else? would like to come. <laughs> Yes. I'm like, if, if, if we're going to Scotland, can I fit in your yes. suitcase? Seriously. <laughs> I always pack super, super tight. And that's always a mistake. Always a mistake. Well, if you're packing me in your suitcase, you're not going to have room for anything else. No, <laughs> so true. we'll have to buy things when we get there. Okay. You're going to have to bring a skill set. I'm hoping that you have some cocktail experience. I'm really strong. <laughs> come, come, come. Yeah, we'll but I can mix the drink. I can mix the drinks too, for sure. Perfect. We'll go adventuring. Love all you said. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, I, I'm happy. And honestly, also, uh, you saw my email on there. My, it should be on the. I don't know if it's on the handout. Probably not. I'm not that smart sometimes. But my email is Elizabeth at elizabethessex.com. If you come up with a question tomorrow. If you want to share something with me tomorrow or the next day or next week, please feel free to write me and say, I heard you at Romance Genre Con and I was confused. Come on. I'm happy to have those emails. Happy to chat with you. Anything else? Eight o'clock time. The buzzer. I just, I'm, I'm so impressed with you, Elizabeth. Like. <laughs> I always say that I, I'm like a gas. I can fill the space in which I'm given, but not as precise as you. I mean, that was just incredible. So I'm, I'm blown I love, away. I know that. I love teaching. I love teaching. I mean, I, I love the craft of writing. I just really do. So I love sharing it with people. And your, also your passion for it. <laughs> it's it's evident. It's evident that you love teaching and that you love writing because that passion really comes across in, in a class like this. And we are just, I mean, well, we're really grateful that you would want to be a part of it. Happy to be here. Oh my goodness. Kisses, smooches of book love <laughs> to everybody. everybody. <laughs> and thank you to Megan and Hannah and Morgan for taking care of me and our other uh, needs throughout the week so we could get these great talks all week and keeping this going in a pandemic and bringing this to all of us. I can't thank you all enough. The, Amy, Morgan, Hannah, and Megan, all of us. Brava, brava. Y'all are magnificent. <laughs> Thank well, you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you know, just a quick reminder for everybody that's uh, hanging in there with us, which a lot of people are still hanging in there just because oh they're probably like waiting for more beautiful nuggets of information. Their, brain are all, but... their brains have all melted. I don't know. No, no. I think everybody's so, so excited. But we do have our big business panel tomorrow with our indie authors, Rachel Van Dyke and Jen LeBlanc and Alexis Morgan Rourke. It's going to be awesome. Uh, I, I love, love those people. To indie authors. Yeah, I, yeah, they're amazing. Um, so if you want to tune in tomorrow, that's going to be tomorrow, 6 o'clock Central Time. So if you're uh, across the country, it's 6 Central. So uh, hang out with us. Um, you know what? My middle name is Elizabeth, and I was not named after, after Elizabeth Essex. But I'm going to start telling people that I was. So. Oh, stop it. Look, <laughs> if, I told if, you this before. You ask. That Hannah is my favorite favorite name. It's my daughter's name. And it's also the, the, the sort of the fairy godmother, the reflection character in A Witch of Blackbird Pond, which is the book that made me want to be a writer. So there you go. Hannah's well, my favorite. We're well, together. Looky there. Best friends forever. <laughs> Can't wait till next year. But we can be it. in person. Well, Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us and thank you, uh, everybody watching. And uh, if you could, we've got a survey. So if you will find that link in the comments, fill out the survey. We already know that you love the program, but go ahead and write it for us anyway. We'd love to uh, get that feedback for Elizabeth and also for the library. We love stats at the library. We are a big we're data nerds, so we like to get that information. But again, make sure to like our Romance Genre Con page. Uh, tune in tomorrow for the Indie Author panel and we will uh,
catch on the flip side. And in the meantime, read some romance and start writing, writing some of these like little tips and tricks. So, uh, there you go. and when you publish, well, when you publish your books, let us know. Cause we want to share that out of our page as well. Absolutely. All right. Bye everybody. Bye everybody. <laughs> <laughs>